Hello and welcome to my second lecture in the series Lagrangian Mean Curvature Flow with Boundary. In the last lecture I talked about mean curvature flow in general, and this lecture I would like to restrict to the case of Lagrangian submanifolds in an ambient Kähler manifold. So it's not immediately obvious that the mean curvature flow of a Lagrangian submanifold should stay Lagrangian, and in fact that's what we will be discussing this lecture, the fact that the mean curvature flow is a canonical way to deform Lagrangian submanifolds. So, we'll start with some definitions. A Kähler manifold is a manifold with compatible complex symplectic and Riemannian structures. And what we mean by compatible is simply that J is an isometry of the Riemannian manifold. In other words, G bar of Jx, Jy is equal to G bar of Xy. And that the G, J, and omega are related in this way. So the omega can be obtained uh, by um, combining the, the almost complex structure and the Riemannian metric. Uh, we also mean that the three structures are all parallel. In other words, that the levi civita connection applied to each of these three structures gives zero. Okay, so... In a Kähler manifold, we have a very special class of submanifolds uh, known as Lagrangian submanifolds. So Lagrangian submanifolds are defined as half-dimensional submanifolds such that if we restrict the ambient Kähler form, the ambient symplectic form, to the Lagrangian, we get zero. And the reason this is important is because if this is the case, then the almost complex structure is an isometry between the tangent bundle and the normal bundle. And this is very easy to see. Obviously, J is already an isometry by the compatibility of the complex structure and the Riemannian structure. Um, and by this compatibility, we have that if uh, X and Y are tangent vectors, then the inner product of Jx and Y is equal to, by the compatibility, omega of X and Y but since L is a Lagrangian submanifold, omega restricted to L is equal to zero, and so this is equal to zero. So we see that J takes tangent vectors to normal vectors. So if we take some basis of the tangent space E1 to En, then E1 to En union JE1 to JEN is a basis for the ambient tangent space. So this is extremely convenient, uh, as we'll see, because a lot of the objects that we work with in mean curvature flow and in submanifold geometry in general are normal objects. And for Lagrangians, we will be able to change these normal objects into tangent objects by using the almost complex structure. Okay, so let's go through uh, an example of Lagrangian submanifolds um, in the most basic case of a Kähler manifold, which is Cn. So in particular, I will be asking the question, when is a graph Lagrangian? So if we have Cn considered as a direct sum of Rn and Rn, like this, uh, and we have some graph, which we can think of as f of x1 to xn, then what condition on f ensures that this graph is Lagrangian? Well, the parameterization of this graph is simply x1 to xn, f1. Actually, I'll put, the, I'll put the index down for the f. f1 to fn, like that. And then this is f of x1 to xn here. And then df by dxi is then simply a 1 in the ith position on the left-hand side of this vector, and then df j by dxi on the right-hand side. And now the condition that L is a Lagrangian submanifold is, of course, that the um, symplectic form restricts to zero. So now we just plug all of these vectors into the symplectic form and ask that all of them are zero and try to change that into a condition on f. So the ambient um, symplectic form on Cn, the standard uh, symplectic form on Cn, is dxi wedge dyi sum over i. And so if we plug in two of these tangent vectors, 
it's easy to see that this is given by dfi by dxj minus dfj by dxi. So one nice way to think about this is if we define a one form alpha as fi dxi, then f, uh, sorry, alpha being closed is exactly the same thing as the graph of f being Lagrangian because d alpha jth component is precisely equal to dfi by dxj minus dfj by dxi which is then zero if the graph of f is Lagrangian by the above calculation. So in flat space the graphical Lagrangians are precisely the graphs of closed one forms. That's not to say that all Lagrangians are of this form, of course. Um, indeed, there are many, many other Lagrangians as well. In particular, this uh, set of imaginary axes is also a Lagrangian submanifold, but certainly cannot be written as the graph over the real axes. Okay, so back in the general case, let's go through some examples of the tensors that we looked at last lecture, but in the Lagrangian case. So firstly, the um, ambient Ricci curvature, which I will denote RIC with a bar, um, can be uh, turned into a two form using the almost complex structure in this way. Rho bar of XY is defined as being equal to the Ricci curvature applied to JXY. And this can also be restricted to a two form on, your, on the Lagrangian. Um, two tensors that have more relation to the actual geometry of the Lagrangian are, of course, the second fundamental form and the mean curvature vector. Uh, and as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, these can now be considered to be tangent objects. So in the case of the second fundamental form, we define this 0, 3 tensor, which I call little h, as uh, the first fundamental form, but dotted with jz for some tangent vector z. So this is measuring the uh, component of the second fundamental form a of xy in the jz direction. So the nice thing about this is that this tensor little h is actually now fully symmetric. It's, it was always the case that the second fundamental form was symmetric in its two vector arguments. But now this new 0, 3 tensor, which has three arguments, is fully symmetric. And we can see that just by doing a short calculation. So if we take h of x, y, z, looks like this. Then we can take the levi civita uh, connection outside, like this. And subtract off the other product rule term. j is parallel, so we can actually take this covariant derivative inside the j, like that. <clears throat> and of course, because uh, uh, L is Lagrangian, um, the inner product of Y and JZ is equal to zero because J is an isomorphism, I isometry, sorry, between the tangent bundle and the normal bundle. And then finally, we can move the J over to the other side using the fact that J is compatible with the metric. And this gives us derivative of Z with respect to X, Y, which is H of X, Z, Y. So we have uh, another symmetry of the second fundamental form that we didn't have before, and this gives us full symmetry in all three of the arguments. Um, as for the mean curvature vector, um, we can also, just in exactly the same way, turn that into a one form. So we can define it by h of x is defined to be the inner product of the mean curvature vector with jx. And uh, if we want to write that in components, then the kth component is just g i j h i j k. More generally speaking, if we have any normal vector to our Lagrangian, then we can do exactly the same thing and turn it into a one form. So if we have n in the normal space to our Lagrangian, or I should really say the normal bundle because we want to end up with a whole one form. So if we have some vector, normal vector fields to our Lagrangian, 
then we can simply define a one form in the same way by taking the inner product of this vector with jx for a tangent vector x. Okay, so now the question is, is there a canonical way to deform a Lagrangian submanifold? So in other words, if we have a Lagrangian submanifold, which normal vector fields on that Lagrangian will correspond to Lagrangian variations? So to answer this question, um, we do a calculation. We want to look at the derivative of the restriction of the symplectic form to the Lagrangian. We'd really like this to remain zero. So understanding the derivative with respect to time under some normal variation of this uh, will give us the answer that we need. So the lemma is as follows. If we have some family of immersions Ft with an initial Lagrangian, uh, and such that the variation is given by some normal vector field n, then we can characterize the derivative of the restriction of omega to l, which I will denote as omega without the bar, uh, by d omega by dt equals minus the exterior derivative of the one form associated to the normal variation. Okay, so how does the proof of this go? Well, we use a, a standard basis, so there's a, a natural basis given to us by the immersion, which is df by dxi equals ei. And then because the initial condition is Lagrangian, if we take all these and rotate them, then we get a basis for the whole space. So now, um, if we do d omega by dt, but the ij component of this, this is equal to d by dt of omega bar of df by dxi, df by dxj. We can take this d by dt inside because omega bar doesn't change with time. So this is omega bar of d squared f by dt dxi df by dxj plus omega bar of df by dxi d squared f by dt dxj. Okay, and now we'll take the d by dxi and d by dxj outside. Um, and what we end up with is d by dxi of omega bar df by dt df by dxj except I'll just quickly rewrite the df by dt nicely as nij of df by dx well I should use nk actually nkj of df by dxk and this is df by dxj here now and then we get an extra term here which is omega bar of df by dt d squared f by dxi dxj and then we have two more terms which are d by dxj of omega bar of df by dxi nkj of df by dxk and then we have one extra term which looks exactly the same as this one except with the terms the other way around but because of the anti-symmetry of omega bar, that means that these two terms actually cancel. So that term disappears. Okay, finally, these last two terms that are remaining are very, very nice indeed. Uh, the compatibility of omega bar j and g bar um, means that this simply extracts the kth component of n. Oh, the, these should be lower indices actually because this is a one form. So this is actually d by dxi of nj. Um, minus d by dxj of ni, which then, of course, just gives us minus the exterior derivative of n, uh, the ith jth component. Okay, so now we have a condition for when the um, restriction of omega to the Lagrangian is preserved under some normal variation. Uh, and that is that the one form corresponding to the normal vector field is closed. So now the question is, is there some canonical vector field that we can choose whose uh, corresponding one form is closed? And the answer will be the mean curvature vector in certain situations. So to prove that, uh, we need to just do a little bit more geometry. So the first thing we need to prove is this really nice fact which uh, is called the traced Kodatsi equation, which is that the Ricci form 
uh, restricted to L. Uh, is equal to minus the exterior derivative of the mean curvature one form. So in order to prove this, the two main ingredients are first the Kodatsi equation, but written in terms of all of our nice tensors. So explicitly this is R I J K J L. So here I'm going to use the convention that a index with an underline represents a J E L component in our basis, which again will be E1 to EN, JE1 to JEN, for uh, E1 to EN spanning a Lagrangian submanifold L. Okay, so the IJK underline ELF component of the ambient Riemannian curvature tensor is given by the difference of two derivatives of the second fundamental form. So this is just the standard Kodatsi equation, but in the specific case of a Lagrangian submanifold where we can write everything in, in terms of tensors um, on the actual Lagrangian itself. So the second thing uh, that we are going to need to use is some symmetries of the Riemannian curvature tensor of the ambient space. So in particular, because J is parallel, we have the ability to change which vectors the J is associated with. So we can move the J onto the left-hand side of this inner product here, for example, and then pull it inside the covariant derivatives um, to get that this is equal to R of X, Y, J, Z, W, with the minus appearing because J squared is equal to minus one. So there are several different ways that we can do this kind of trick and end up with some identities, including this one here, which is R I J K underline L is equal to minus R I J underline K L. And we can also get the identity r of i, j, underline k, underline l is equal to r, i, j, k, l. Okay, so with that in mind, um, this lemma is simply a calculation. So if we start with, if we remember that the Ricci form is given by r, k, i, underline i, j, upper k, where k sums over all of the uh, vectors um, uh, all of the vectors in our basis um, but by our convention we want our non-underlined indices to just span over the E1 to EN and our underlined indices to go from JE1 to JEN so we actually here using this notation have to add on a second term which is a sum over the underlined Ks as well okay so now we want to prove this is equal to minus DH so we just go right ahead we start with this term here. This is just a type changed Romanian curvature tensor. And now we can use our symmetries of the Romanian curvature tensor to swap around these indices here in this following way. And then we can apply our Kodatsi equation to get that this is equal to G of uh, G K M Nabla J H M K I minus Nabla M H J K I. Then we use the symmetries of H itself. Remember that H is a fully symmetric zero three tensor. To write this as G K M Nabla J H M K I minus Nabla M H I J K. And then we apply the Kodatsi equation again in reverse by splitting that final term as follows. So this is equal to minus nabla i h m k j plus a Romanian curvature tensor term. 
Then finally, this left hand side here, we see that two of the second fundamental form indices are being contracted. So this is actually just derivatives of the mean curvature one form. And then this final term is just applying some more symmetries of the Riemannian curvature tensor, the remaining component of the Ricci form. So this ends up telling us that the ij component of this Ricci form is equal to the ij component of the negative of the exterior derivative of the mean curvature one form. So what this tells us is that the mean curvature one form is closed as long as the Ricci form restricted to the Lagrangian is equal to zero, because then we have that this dh is equal to zero. So an example of when this holds is when our ambient Ricci form is equal to some multiple, some constant multiple of the Kähler form. And this is known as the Kähler-Einstein condition. So the Ricci form being some constant multiple of the Kähler form is equivalent to the Ricci tensor being some constant multiple of the Riemannian metric, which is uh, the usual way that people think of the Einstein condition, constant Ricci curvature. So if this is the case then, we have that the restriction of the Ricci form to the Lagrangian is of course equal to zero because of the Lagrangian condition. And that means that the exterior derivative of the mean curvature one form is equal to zero. So in conclusion, we know that in the case when our ambient Kähler manifold is also an Einstein manifold, then our mean curvature one form is closed and therefore a Lagrangian submanifold um, perturbed in the direction of the mean curvature vector infinitesimally remains Lagrangian. Unfortunately, this is not enough to prove that mean curvature flow preserves the Lagrangian condition, because it could be the case that at the initial moment, infinitesimally, omega uh, remains zero. So d omega by dt equals zero at t equals zero. But that doesn't mean that this omega restricted to the Lagrangian couldn't lift off and become non-zero um, for arbitrarily small t. So this demonstrates that there is a chance of the Lagrangian condition being preserved under mean curvature flow in Kähler-Einstein manifolds, but it is not a proof. In order to actually prove it, we need to prove an analytic estimate. So firstly, we have to work with a more general class of submanifolds than just Lagrangians in order to do our calculations, because we cannot guarantee that after time t equals zero, our uh, submanifold will be Lagrangian anymore. However, it's extremely convenient to be able to work with these uh, zero, three tensors and forms instead of the mixed tangent normal tensors um, of general submanifold geometry. So the trick is that there is a condition which is an open condition that Lagrangians satisfy, um, which allows us to do this, um, and we call it the totally real condition. So we say that uh, submanifold L is totally real if J applied to the tangent space does not have any vectors in common with the normal space. This then allows us to recover an isomorphism from this uh, isomorphism J by then just projecting the image of J down to the normal space of L. So this is no longer an isometry but it now is possible to turn A and H into tensors on the tangent bundle, just like we did before. So for example, we may define H tilde of X, Y, Z, where X, Y, Z are tangent vectors in L um, as the inner product of the second fundamental form um, with j tilde z, which is a normal vector now. And similarly, h tilde of x can be defined as the mean curvature vector inner producted with j tilde x. So some 
a calculation very, very similar to the calculation that we did above tells us that it is still the case that d omega by dt is equal to minus dh tilde. Furthermore, we may get an estimate on the derivative of the size of omega in terms of the Laplacian and a positive zeroth order term uh, with, <laughs> with a, lot of, uh, a lot more work and a lot more algebra. This is exactly what we need because we now want to apply the parabolic maximum principle to conclude that omega, the size of omega must remain zero. So I will quickly go over the proof of that. So the statement now of the final theorem is, if we have some smooth mean curvature flow starting with the Lagrangian in a Kähler-Einstein manifold, then the flow remains Lagrangian for all time. And the proof is as follows. So firstly, we may assume uh, that LT is totally real. Um, because a Lagrangian is certainly totally real, because the totally real condition is a weakening of the idea that J is an isometry between the tangent space and the normal space. So the totally real condition is an open condition and it will be true for some set of times perhaps smaller than the total uh, the, than the maximal amount of time up to capital T. So then um, we may apply our interior estimate um, and in particular we're going to pick a nice function. Um, f epsilon is going to equal the size of omega squared minus epsilon times e to the 2ct for the same c as in the interior estimate. Then this function is cleverly chosen such that uh, if we differentiate this with respect to time we may use our interior estimate to say that this is less than or equal to Laplacian of mod omega squared plus c mod omega squared minus 2 epsilon, sorry, 2 c, 2 epsilon times c times e to the 2 c t. And then this, due to the definition of f epsilon, is, e, is less than or equal to Laplacian f epsilon plus c f epsilon. Note that Laplacian of mod omega squared is the same as the Laplacian of f epsilon because this term here is just dependent on time and not space. Okay, so why did we do this? Well, now this f epsilon is initially negative for small epsilon. And by parabolic maximum principle, uh, it must be always negative. And so now tending epsilon to zero, we retrieve the fact that mod omega squared must be less than or equal to zero on zero T1, which actually implies that mod omega squared is equal to zero because of course, mod omega squared is positive. And though we've over, uh, only proven this on zero t1, um, because this implies that lt is Lagrangian from naught up to t1, we must then be able to extend t1 further. It must then be totally real for a little bit longer. Um, so we're actually able to prove that the totally real condition is uh, open and closed on this set of times. Um, and therefore, this argument actually applies to the full time interval zero up to t and the Lagrangian condition is indeed preserved. Okay, finally I wanted to talk about one example. So we're going to take the example of graphs uh, in Cn and we're going to do Lagrangian mean curvature flow in that case and see what happens. So let's take a closed one form in uh, on Rn, 
which as we know will then correspond to a graph in CN, which is a Lagrangian submanifold. So then because we're in RN and the cohomology is trivial, we know that there exists a function u on Rn such that du equals alpha. So then as before, we have our graph f, which I'm going to uh, write as f of x is equal to x alpha. Um, and we can then write this instead as where x is a vector here in Rn. And we can write this as x, and then below here, I'm going to put uk from k equals 1 up to n, where uk is just shorthand for du by dxk. So alpha is a vector of derivatives of u. Then the derivative of f df by dxi is equal to ei uik, where this is now a second derivative of u. And so on our Lagrangian, the metric gij is equal to df by dxi, df by dxj in a producted, which will be delta ij plus uik ukj. We can also quite easily calculate what the second fundamental form is um, because this is simply the inner product of d squared f by dx i dx j by j of df by dx k, which if we write this out, the, this left hand vector is zero u i j, sorry, u i j k, because it's a second derivative now um, from, actually I shouldn't write k, I should write l, from l equals one up to n, in a producted with j of df by dx k, which is just minus u k l from l equals one up to n e k. And then this is just equal to u i j k or the thir a third derivative of u. So our second fund the components of our second fundamental form are just the components of the third derivative of this um, this function u, this primitive. Finally, the mean curvature vector hk is equal to gijhijk, which is here just gijuijk. And then mean curvature flow is, of course, just df by dt perpendicular part is equal to h. I think in the first lecture I said that mean curvature flow was just df by dt equals the mean curvature vector. This is a more general um, a more general flow if we just ask that the normal component of our uh, family of immersions, <clears throat> the derivative in the time direction of the family of immersions gives you the mean curvature vector. But any flow that satisfies uh, this condition will actually be the same up to some tangential diffeomorphisms. So if our graph satisfies this condition, then this is exactly the same as the inner product of df by dt with j of some vector being the same as the mean curvature one form by just changing the type using j. And now we can see that this is just the same as just calculating what df by dt is. This is the same as the exterior derivative of du by dt equaling the mean curvature one form. So if we pick a primitive theta of h, i.e. d theta equals h, then mean curvature flow is precisely the same as this function on the level of primitives, this equation, sorry, on the level of primitives, du by dt is equal to theta plus maybe some constant that only depends on time. In particular, notice that the mean curvature flow being able to be written in terms of the primitive immediately tells us that the flow remains Lagrangian because this primitive 
defines a graph by its exterior derivative and that one form therefore must be closed since it's exact. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say about Lagrangian mean curvature flow. Thank you very much for listening so far. Um, next time I'll be talking about uh, my joint work with Ben Lambert and Chris Evans and I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. Goodbye.